Boa sorte. Good luck. Have a great lecture session. Have a nice debate. And I'm going to be here in the background just watching, okay? Anna, all my kisses to you, please. Stay here with me, Anna. Okay, too many men in the afternoon lately. What have you done? I think I have to stay here a little longer with Anna because she's going to be also lonely. Yes, we had Barbara and uh, from the UCL. I think she broke her knee during her vacation. And unfortunately, she couldn't be here for her for, for the sessions. But professor from the UCL, uh, so she's a Marcia's friend. She has very important governance work uh, that she's been carrying out. Yes, but in the morning, we had more women, you know? There's always this difference. Yes, we had Margot and Sarah and it's a shame what we hear. I'm sorry about Barbara. She's just so great. Yes, this is an important parameter. We need to balance boys and girls uh, in between sessions. Well, but we're going to start in a few now. I'm going to open real quick and then give the floor to Luis Guilherme. He's, he's going to have an institutional opening for the school. And then we're going to give the floor to Shalita and then Ana Claudia, then Antonio Carlos and then Tadeo. 20 minutes each and then we are going to have a 20 to 23 minutes debate please explain how uh, and why barbara was absent just to to make sure that this lady was not here but just to be equal uh on boys and girls uh yes uh, are, are you recording the session at all yes we are so we need to edit and take this uh, little chit chat that we are having at the beginning because today in the morning, earlier in the morning, everyone enjoyed it very much. Yes, let's do it. Okay, I'm going to stay here for the beginning, okay? Okay, thanks so much. Okay, well, yeah, we have to pay attention to do things. Oh, Claudia, acho que podemos. Vamos well, lá. Claudia, I think we can do it. You let me know when to start. Pode começar, professor. Boa tarde a todas e todos. Boa tarde para quem está aqui no Brasil. Boa noite para. Morning everybody. Uh, good afternoon for those in Brazil. Good evening for those who are in the northern uh, hemisphere. I'd like to start our second session. Our, we had an excellent session with four speeches in the morning. Unfortunately, we were not able to have a debate, but we will have time this afternoon. We in uh, this international webinar on public policies and the future of cities in a post pandemic scenario. We'll have four speakers. I'll introduce them soon, followed by a debate. I'd like to say that this event has uh, support from uh, Capi Sprint and the ProX program in the Architecture and Urbanism College of uh, Presbyt Marquise Presbyterian University. You can participate uh, in the chat. We'll present the questions to our speakers after the, the, the presentations and we'll upload the recordings in our channel on YouTube for our college. I'll now, now I would like to pass the floor to our coordinator in our architecture and urbanism uh, college. Uh, and I'll pass the word to our, to Luis Guilherme. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you. As I said, I'm the coordinator of the postgraduate studies in architecture and 
urban plan planning at Mackenzie. And I'd like to say that this uh, seminar is very important for us, both for the postgraduate studies and for the architecture college. Hosting this initiative that is talking about cities uh, post uh, pandemics, an issue that is not only an academic one, but that interests to the public in general, it's a great pleasure. It's a very important uh, webinar. The uh, presentations in the morning were excellent, as Carlos said, and I'm sure the ones in the afternoon will be just as excellent. I welcome all of you speakers, all our attendees, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. Uh, great to hear you. As I said, this afternoon we'll have four presentations, and I'll quickly introduce our speakers. Our first guest is Professor Gabriel Chalit, our colleague in the law uh, college here in Mackenzie. Chalit is a lawyer, a professor, writer, and Brazilian pol politician. He's a professor at the law college here in Mackenzie. He's part of the directing uh, board of Casa do Sabor and a member of the Brazilian Union of uh, Writers and the uh, São, São Paulo Academy of uh, Letters. I'll, now in the, I'll soon pass you the floor, Gabriel. Next, we'll have Ana Claudia Hosbach. She's an urbanist uh, here in the institution. We, she's a great colleague to all of us who work in this area here. She's a specialist in social uh, housing. She has worked for numerous international institutions. She has also participated in a regulatory uh, mark that we have here in Brazil. She's a part of urbanism history in Brazil. She's also the regional uh, manager for Cities Alliance, Alliance for Latin America and the Caribbean. Then we have Professor Antonio Carlos Rodriguez Amaral. He is a lawyer, PhD, director of CEMAPI, the Mackenzie Center for Advanced Studies in Public Policies and Integrity Policies. He's also he's a visiting scholar at Columbia Law School. And to close our session, we have, and to close our day in a very good way, we have Professor Tadeus Palossi, the Administrative Director for the Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes at Columbia University. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us. And after the four speeches, we'll have a debate between us and answering the questions from the others. Gabriel Chalita, you have the floor. Thank you for being with us. I know you have a very busy agenda, so thank you. Just one more thing. I forgot to say that, unfortunately, in the afternoon, as we couldn't have the presence of Professor Barbara Libies from UCL, she had a uh, little accident last week and she's not able to be here with us today but we're recording this event she'll be watching and we we'll, we should have other opportunities sorry gabriel you have the floor thank you professor carlos it's always a pleasure to participate in any events that you organize uh always excellent uh events i'd like to Say hello to my colleague uh, speakers here. Also, uh, Ana Claudia, Antonio Carlos, Adeus, Angelica, who came here to spend a few minutes with us. I love working in this institution. We have such a great tradition in uh, teaching and a, 
a historical concern with matters that are of importance for the public in general. It's great to be here in this opportunity with people who are thinking about the city, about an urbanism that is more welcoming, more inclusive architecture, uh, providing more dignity for people in the cities. I think I'll go into the realm of literature uh, to talk about what I believe might be the future for the cities in this post-pandemic scenario. We are talking a lot about the post-pandemic scenario and we are not quite, quite there yet. And uh, some people are kind of forgetting that they, and thinking things are normal. We are not there yet. I'd like to think of some of our greatest writers to the uh, worm that eaten the the, the meat in my bones, I dedicate my posthumous uh, memories. This is from the works of Machado de Assis in the first chapter, talking about the death of the author, saying, for sometimes I thought if I should start these memoirs from the beginning or the end, if I should talk first about my birth or my death. We are at a time of births and deaths the deaths and fears frighten us, but at all times we were afraid. Fear is uh, present in life forever. Philosophy started by debating fear. The philosophers wanted to figure out where we were going and uh, questioning uh, issues, but always in fear. And we are living in fear. And living in the city leads us to fear. Cecilia Mireles has a poem that says, you have to end fear. You die a little in love and uh, sadness, and you are reborn in all these feelings. It's something that is changed, but it's always the same that will have prior priorities until you're not no longer afraid to die and you'll be eternal. She's, this is one of her metaphysical poems. When you think about a scenario of the cities post uh, pandemic, we can choose for a necessary rebuilding of the physical aspects of the city, or we can navigate in other margins, a third margin if you wanted to say that. And if you think about uh, Matheus Rosa and his uh, character that was not in either margin, but was going up and down the river, Guimarães Rosa uh, navigating a river that crosses the arid area that lives in us. That leads us to a reflection about the world that happens not after what Machado just said, but after a virus that at some point silenced humanity, stole embraces, anticipated departures. We see the big cities stopped with nobody. That city of the Pope celebrating uh, the, the Easter to an empty square was something. We had a desire in the beginning thinking that after the pandemics, we would value encounters, we would be better people. We would all think of building a concrete and imaginary bridges that would lead us to the sacred meeting with the others. For thinking about the sacred part of the people, the secret aspect of the city, the physical aspects of the city are essential. You can think of vertical di dimensions and the presence of men in the cities without thinking about the cities horizontally. And uh, Bauman's meeting, he deals with the imaginary and concrete dangers in the cities that lead options to be more towards walls than bridges, an obsession with safety, an obsession that uh, dialogues with fear human beings can generate in other human beings. We just saw in Arasatuba something that was very scary, 
it seems like a series of what someone is capable to do to somebody else. The publicity of, on all that brings us even more fear. And then we have the industry of security and safety promising you a safe space in the area. The fear of being attacked or killed, the fear that something that is di someone different from me what they can do to me. But this is a philosophical question. Is there anybody who is like me? I'm afraid of what's different, but is there anybody who is the same as I am? When we think of homogeneity, it might be led to believe, yes, if I live in a condominium surrounded by walls, I might think that those who live inside are similar to me and those who live outside may represent some danger because they're different. I had very complex experiences when I was director of some schools with parents wanting to protect the children from the rest of the world uh, in parts of the city that were very much protected. And I convinced the parents to take them in their children in adventures to visit the center of the city, the central market, to let them see all the dif diversity that uh, lives in the city. And I can tell you that children, they are teacher uh, on the daily pleasure, pleasures of life. The being that bus uh, and experience all the hectic movement around them, the conversations they had about all the different colors, smells, tastes, that's the city brings. The city outside the walls belongs to them also. Walls prevent the other, the ones, the outsiders from coming in, but it prevents us, those who live inside, from going out. This is how it goes with the foreigners. The fear of the foreign things makes me waste uh, the richness of encounters and learning. Sao Paulo, for example, is a city that was made for foreigners. They've all mixed together in the pursuit of a new home. They've instituted the pain of the absence and they've replaced it to the hope of planting something different. I was born in a small town in the countryside and decided to come to Sao Paulo to make a living. I remember the very first days uh, I was fascinated by the fear and fascinated by the life and the movements of the movement of people fascinated me. I learned a solidarity that was different from the solidarity within my countryside city. These, count, these came from organized movements that looked into surpassing the very sad, uh, the very sad historical pattern of this city, which is the solitude. And it's painful for everyone, for those who see and for those who are not seen. In the schools that I teach, I always talk about the risk of competition because it can, uh, bury the human way of collaborating. We are uh, seen as a uh, an industry that produce people who succeed. But who succeeds? Who are the winners? Those who get great jobs, those who earn a lot of money. Many of the things are going to make us losers. Because if I understand that I am part of the other side of the, uh, of the, the wall, and I'm part of that, and I'm going to lose my human kind feeling in, of being. Sometimes I'd rather not see what, what bothers me. Sometimes I choose not to know what happens to the other person and who are the other people. There are many ways of segregating and all of them prevent us from seeing what is beautiful in the other human being, which is seen through the encounters of human beings. Aristotle said that we are social animals then, and for us to develop, someone had to take care of us. Fish are born and bred just free. They are born and they go. Birds, they, are, they, they hatch the eggs and they go, but we don't. We need to surpass the, the desire of being in the center of everything so that we can reach uh, a theme, a, a purpose for living. And I listen uh, 
And I hear this from my students a lot in regard in regarding to their aspirations. So they want us to be, to be judges, but mine, the other person will say, oh, I want to be a delegate. And I want to be a sheriff. I want to be the judge because this is going to give me power. And I, some people just say that they want to be judges because they want to wipe the injustice from us from earth for example people say that they want to be doctors because they want to heal the the pain that mankind feels i want to be a politician because i want to use uh i want to be a politician why is that because i want to use the 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 power and everything that this is going to give me or because i want to do something for my my population the pandemics has affected schools and solidarity is ha, has not flourished. I am more willing to ask questions than giving answers, but people are more violent, they are lacking patient, and they are more willing to look for their allies. In the political discourse, there is a lot of simplest, uh, simplicity and and humility and competence is lacking. Fake news is now spread as strong as never. And the radicals and the extreme uh, actions are corrupting. And the other side is unknown because we are not living the fascinating experience of encounters. The peripheral areas are isolating. Uh, they are moving and coming and going, and the commuting is challenging in Sao Paulo because the system created distances so that uh, those who are part of the population would not be close to the other side of the story. The structure is destructive. So how can we do this? Sometimes it's common to see uh, condos selling land very far away and separated from everyone else. Let's share our space with those who do not threat us or cause us to be afraid. Uh, the uh, fear of mixing, as Carl said, Carl Marx said, it's the fear of living with different people and this teaches us and they can learn from us so how can we overcome them the fear of mixing and mixophilia how can we turn these spaces into spaces of dialogue and pleasure we need to include the parks and the and the rivers and the society and make these spaces something that everyone can use you see uh, cities are reducing the speed of cars. There is a polemic theme because we need to show people that we need a safe places for people to walk on. Uh, lives, uh, future lives are not developed within uh, intellectual concerns only. It is schools is where light is created. The time and space there are different. Today, we are different from what we were yesterday or what we were before the pandemics. And we are going to be different from that as well. Spaces cause this. It's like uh, the river uh, mentioned by Ephesus. Can we use and be bathed by the same water twice? Can we ask the water from the river to stop just to contemplate beauty? No, the river has a flow and a course and we have to understand that it is discomforting and what does not please us can also coexist with what pleases us. With sadness, I've seen uh some news on people saying goodbye to teachers because they're not going to study anymore in kabul this group of power is doing this these are truths that are being justified by religions i've always studied religions as a reconnecting semantics or not disconnecting 
I cannot grasp the meaning of this hate in the name of God. The women of Kabul are part of the same humankind we are part of. The millions of refugees are part of the same humankind. The young people who die prematurely, victims of any sort of all sorts of violence, they are also part of the same group, the same humankind. I remember one mother when I was the secretary of the education, the cemetery of uh, Jardim São Luis and that mother saying, look at the date of birth and date of death of all graves. Statistics show these feelings. How come in peripheral areas, young people die so much more than the other neighborhoods? If we see the disparity, the inequality we were talking about just before we started, the, we have to consider that the virtual world is also uh, a place for disparity. How many have been out of school because they could not access the internet or did not have any access to what they needed online for research or anything? No structure, no technology, no space for learning. And education is the basis to start changing this place of inequality. This can reduce inequality, but if education in itself is already unequal, this is not going to help. And don't blame the teachers. They are masters in supplying maximum with minimum and how to overcome thing problems, how to open doors, but alone they cannot achieve anything. Uh, it doesn't matter who is in charge, who is in the government. Now we need to respect the educators and with integrating curricula. In practice, we see everything going down the trash and minimum space for learning. Thinking of the city for better or coexistence depends on the type of education that we provide. Uh, respect is a habit, it needs to be practiced, it needs to turn into habit. We need intellectual motivation to make us shake this temporary truth that we are living in. And just at closing, I'm just going to mention Machado, Cecilia and Guimarães Rosa. Literature is a history of feelings, and it comes from coexisting, listening, paying attention to people, sharing impression, loving. Within poetry, in literature, music, in all arts, human is being showing their anguish, their pain, and in a genial Machado, uh, he, Cecilia, and Guimarães Rosa's texts, this is where we find humanity. They are the spokesper they were the spokespersons of us. Criolo, a Brazilian rapper, he says there is no love in Sao Paulo. We could change this point of view. We could put love into this and other cities. And how is this possible? How can we plant a, a, a flower garden? in Sao Paulo or in other big cities in the world? How can we, uh, how can we fight uh, this prejudice and this problem? And how can we walk hand in hand and flirt with the day? And how can we share this space without fighting? How, and how can we see how good we feel every time we overcome what separates us? Uh, let's just hope that the very small interactions on our daily lives help us uh, see the city so that we can see the center, we can see the corner, the sacred of living, and how can we see the sacred with respect and admiration. Admiration comes with love. Maybe we should contemplate people with more love, people who coexist with us in the cities. This is it. Thank you. Gabriel Shalita, you are just wanting to make everyone cry, aren't you? This is just so beautiful. It is just so good to have a philosopher, a writer, a poet among us. And of course, 
a very competent professor that you are, Gabriel Chalita, a multidisciplinary person. Thank you very much. Ana Claudia Rosbach. Let's get back to the show. Wow, that is just so hard. Gabriel, I think uh, you've confirmed the theory that PowerPoint presentations are just so not necessary. But I, I just recalled two things. I'm going to mention a few things as well. I've prepared a presentation, but I just recall two things that I usually say. One is that I have an affection and an interesting relationship with Mackenzie because I was a student there and Mackenzie has presented me the city of Sao Paulo. I come from uh, from a distant uh, area of Sao Paulo. I was born in Sao Paulo, but I moved away for quite a while and then came back. But my idea was to study a specific neighborhood in the city. And when I uh, entered Mackenzie, I found out that Sao Paulo was so huge, it had to be divided into north, south part, and it had a huge diversity. I fell in love with this. First time I set foot in the city, because of the university that I went to, there were some divergencies, but they were just so small. And another thing the school has brought me, apart from pre presenting me with the city, uh, in regard to literature, I was introduced to Machado de Assis and he became my favorite author. And also Luis de Azevedo. And I read O Cortiço and that book became when I was 14, uh, became important. It is. It has been following me since then. It's one of my Brazilian uh, favorite Brazilian artists, uh, writer, and it helped me uh, raise awareness on what that book really meant. And this presented me a visible part of this river of this city. I never thought I was going to have a career supporting. Uh, slum, social uh, housing and stuff. This was, these were two uh, very affectionate relationship aspects of my relationship with Mackenzie and the way Gabriel was mentioned everything. I just wanted to share this with you. I have prepared a speech about uh, the future of the cities and I thought about three things. First of all, I would like to call um, your attention to two specific issues where I think that for the future we have to have attention, intention and action. And that involves uh, different uh, areas of work. First is the vulnerability of uh, the suburban territories, Doris, uh, the impact of uh, COVID in settlements and on the population who live from informal economy was very um, big. And another aspect is centrality of uh, housing, how important it is for us to have a house at a time of COVID and how people who are homeless or uh, in precarious situations were not able to meet the minimum requirements from uh, the w WHS. And in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, in several uh, Latin American countries, we had a boom of uh, the building sector, of, of constructions, and the number of houses being built and the need for houses. And this is something we have to be very attentive to when we think of the futures of our cities, especially in the global south. Another thing I want to pay attention to are the processes. We have gone through several processes in Latin America and in the global south, where we have solidarity networks mobilized in several different cities. And this represents a strengthening of the social capital in our cities, which opens several opportunities to uh, be the basis of a future after the pandemics. And I want to point out some opportunities related to this era this situation we expect to have after the pandemics. We are talking about post-pandemic times, but we're still living a pandemics. 
I prepared some of uh, the presentation uh, in English, but I'll talk in Portuguese. I'd like to remind you of global agendas and where cities are regarding these commitments made globally. I think the most important one is the climate agenda, the fundamental cities thinking about the world, which is mostly urbanized, uh, urbanization should be increasing all over. In Brazil, we have 85% of the population living in cities, and the cities uh, represent a fundamental role in this uh, fight against uh, climate change, both for mitigation and prevention. Another important agenda are the Sustainable Development Goals uh, that says we shouldn't leave anybody behind. And we have specific object uh, goal which regards the city and sustainable communities. And uh, this gets to, do to, gets to what I was saying about the informal settlements. They, are, we, they need to be mapped. They are not in the maps. We need laws that allow for interventions in these areas. Many In many countries, we are not able to bring water to these areas because the law doesn't allow you to implement infrastructure in areas that are not formally uh, recognized in the territory. So we have a long way to go to meet this goal. And all these goals are very much grounded on the city, health, gender equality, poverty, reducing inequalities, and that it's in the city we need to make that happen. Uh, this is the scenario for the, for the 2030 agenda. And then we have this agenda that many people don't know. This is a famous uh, unknown, which is called the new uh, urban uh, agenda approved here in 2016. And at that time, principles were defined, common principles were defined to guide the agenda for the city. The countries that signed this agenda uh, took over to themselves to, to do this. It was a different agenda, very different from the economical or climate agendas, where you see the countries so far away signing treaties. This was came after two years uh, with several different thematic spaces, with important themes that affect our cities, regional spaces, cities from uh, an African point of view, from a, a perspective from Asia, Latin America, the global north, spaces where uh, a common agendas were debated, common topics were debated, and where we had the participation of various different actors, local governments, and several other actors from even the private sector. And at this conference, the new urban agenda was signed. I took this picture in Asuncion, in Paraguay, and the reality of Latin America and the global south is reflected there, where you have a formal city full of informal poverty spaces that are highly vulnerable. In the slide, I brought some elements from this new urban agenda that are very uh, uh, particular about that I w wish would guide the future of our cities. It's a very complex agenda, as any international agreement, it's uh, something that uh, is full of controversies, that, but it brings very progressive principles, very advanced pr principles. And I think this agenda is of great advancement for us. It brings several uh, elements of the rights of the city. It says that people should be at the center. 
it says that uh, urban agendas should be focused on uh, oriented towards human rights. It talks about gender equality and how important it is to build cities, to develop cities from a feminine perspective with women and for women with a con uh, contemplating the diversity of gender that we have the need for a participative government mechanism of course the national states and the laws are important are important the great investment policies and uh, funding policies are there but it's the local protagonism of those who really know the reality that will be able to mobilize the forces uh, with joint responsibility to change that territory. It's not the local administration. It's the community, the social, civil society as protagonists in our cities. The importance of the national actor would be as the one who makes feasible the whole action. And the urban agenda talks about informality. It's prevailing in the world. Around the world, we have 60% of the world, world uh, in, of informal workers. We have an uncertain uh, percentage of people living in informal situations around the world. but. Uh, data from the World Bank says that 60% of uh, this informal settlements are around the world. I think that the, I risk saying that the informal is our reality, our city of the future. We will have to be able to incorporate and integrate the informal. I don't see the informal becoming formal. I see changing to accept and integrate, creating exceptions that will become the rule diversity uh, and the diversity that the informality brings us. The agenda talks about the importance of public spaces. Gabriel mentioned the walls. We have a wall, a cities divided by walls and we really need uh, public spaces, parks, green areas. We have few streets that are open. I was uh, joking the other day and said if I was the mayor of Sao Paulo, I would open all the streets for playing and leave all the cars at home because people in Sao Paulo need to go out on the street. They need to breathe in pandemic. And uh, some people said, well, I vote, I'd vote for you. But yeah, uh, what I mean is we need public spaces and we have a long way to go in that sense. In the peripheral areas of the city, ensuring that everybody has access to these leisure places and are able to enjoy the city and also uh, the social function of the land and we still have a lot to do in that area you really need to make property and uh, urban land to work towards uh, uh, people that's what you are saying carlos the statute of the city brings this opportunity to do something. In 20 years, we have moved, gone a long way. We, rec we acknowledge the informal settlements. We introduced some uh, democratic management uh, systems in our cities, but we still have a long way to go. We have a lot to do to bring the low income population uh, to participate in the city, to increase the connection between the different regions of uh, the cities, especially in the global south, but also in the north. And the global urban agenda mentions, as I said, the importance of having housing at the center of our urban agenda. And where are we in our region? And now I'm going to talk a little bit about our region because this is an area I've been intensely worked in, but I think the characteristics are also seen in many other places we have a very serious uh, problem in afghanistan in several other countries in latin america is one of the most violent regions of the world like the case mentioned in arasatuba with many social conflicts but we see this in paraguay colombia haiti and this is our context 
this is the context of the cities in the future. We are also experienced intense migration flux, uh, flows in our region, increased poverty, increased informality, and so uh, what for uh, for me to close my part in this pick with a more uh, 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 hopeful perspective. What are the opportunities we have? I think we have created several levels of uh, responses and governance post COVID. We found actors offering answers in communities at regional and national level. We have groups and slums that got together all all over Brazil and created associations in uh, Rio de Janeiro, for example, they had uh, some council based on these different groups that started meeting formally with a proposal of solidarity. We also observed that in many other countries and cities with emergency responses, but who that really need support from the civil society in this process and also in Latin America, we have several spaces for dialogue about the pandemics, how the cities are doing, city alliances. We try to facilitate the exchange of information in different cities with the sharing of answers and how these answers, these res emergency responses can be the pillars of the basis for us to overcome this uh, structural gaps we have. And we got to a consensus on priority of action that supports uh, and integrates vulnerable territories. You were talking about the nucleus and in INSPIR. They're already talking about this theme in Latin America for years already. We have several experiences in the upgrading with precarious situations. How can we still be in uh, with places in such situations? These spaces for consensus, for me, they strengthen the social capital and prevent mechanisms for governance. We facilitate CELARA conference. It's the Conference of American States. The theme was housing but how housing can be used for economical activation, but not only because they create jobs or can be an alternative for investments, but because they, they can be applied holistically through genuine job creation. And this is what we are going to do in way, uh, through overcoming structural gaps. It's not about only recovering from a problem in economy. It is about improving this housing with several different programs and that do not aim property alone but also interact with different populations such as the elderly the young people immigrants etc it's a more holistically and integrated approach to housing and these concepts are interesting because and we are going to see whether this is going to make the uh, more feasible um, activities to happen. And I think that these uh, opportunities and the question of housing being so central, it opens up two different fronts that are very important. One, in a more pragmatic uh, approach. I am an economist, although I consider myself as an urbanist, uh, of course, not uh, officially, but from an economic perspective, it represents the opening of new markets through different approaches. We can open new markets and we can, at the same time, respect rights, works with uh, social sustainability, environmental sustainability and the like. And it opens up gigantic frontiers uh, in the social area for this city. It integrates a social uh, active and economical uh, asset, and it opens up different cultural uh, frontiers. It's an opportunity for transformation, and it's an opportunity for continuously change and value our invisible assets. It is a way of aggregating integrating, connecting, 
enjoy the city and recognizing the social function of the city. So this is what I wanted to say. These are all my messages. I, uh, I was just so emotioned and touched by the by the invitations that I just forgot to thank every one of you before I started talking. So thank you very much, Anna. It was great. Let's move forward to our next guest, Professor Antonio Carlos Rodriguez do Amaral. Uh, he's a little bit here in Sao Paulo and a little bit in the United States. Welcome, and you have the floor. Well, first of all, so that I don't forget, if just like Ana Claudia did, I would like to start by thanking Carlos Leite, Professor Carlos Leite, for the invitation for me to be here in this international webinar with all the very important panelists, Ana Claudia Rosbach, Gabriel Chalita, Professor Tadeusz Paulowski from Columbia University. Let me now share my screen. I have prepared a few slides with a roadmap. Okay, can you see it? Okay, good. So in my very quick introduction, first of all, it is an honor to talk about such a relevant team, the future of cities in the post-pandemic scenario. As Professor Ana Claudia said, the theme of cities is essential. It's been debated for decades. Uh, it's part of the building of society. As Shalita said, uh, the man is a political animal. And what did Aristotle say that? Because he used to live in a polis and depended on other people for the survival. The ostracism was the capital punishment in, in those times. Being sent away from the city was a curse. So we are now living very dangerous moments. And all of a sudden, our lives are among so many uncertainties within societies. And these uncertainties are affecting, of course, the populations that are more vulnerable. Let's just start this short presentation by talking about our center, CEMAPI, which is the Advanced Studies of Public Policies and Integrity Policies, policies part of the uh, Architecture and Urbanism School here from Mackenzie. Uh, CEMAPI was created in 2019. It was inspired by the Center for Advancement of Public Integrity that is part of the Columbia University, CAPE, and part of the Columbia Law School. I was there uh, as a visitor fellow uh, in New York and I was very close to the center just to understand how the integrity public policies affect the development of the cities, countries, and businesses and economy and public policies as a whole. So based in, these con in this concept, we created our own center that was inspired by CAPI. And we've conceived this center at Columbia with the participation of several professors, the pro Hector, uh, Hector Carelli, Chiarello, uh, the minister uh, Barroso, Marcelo Bretas, the judge, and several other authorities were there. And I was the honor of uh, coordinating this event. And the Dean of CAP was also there. So in this event, we had Professor Ismanio, Antonio Cesar Freitas uh, from Mackenzie, the president of the strategic committee, the highest governance department from our center uh, that is uh, under Mackenzie's jurisdiction. The Ministry of Education was there, Marcelo Bretas, Borges was also there. 
the judge and minister, uh, minister Roberto Barroso and Berger, the director for the center. This is part of the event with several international judges. And on the right side, you see that is an annual event created by CAPI called Global Cities. And during this event, the theme of, de of uh, cities uh, is debated globally. We were explaining about the center in this event and how this was going to be developed in Brazil. It was launched in October 2019. We had a, a large group in Mackenzie and our idea was going to be to op operalize the uh, on-site events in 2020. We had the opportunity to take part of some of the uh, United Nations events and some in Europe in contact with lots of universities in Europe. And in 2020, we were ready to make Semapi grow, grow, but then the pandemics hit us and you all know the story. We had a series of webinars with several different systems and Professor Awamed uh, from Mackenzie also uh, worked with international uh, webinars in this matter, in this uh, subject. We, we've written a few articles just to develop the concept of this center that integrates pol uh, integrity policies and public policies. And integrity in this sense is analyzed within two aspects. First of all, they deal directly with anti-corruption actions, anti-fraud, against abuse, waste, errors, mistakes, jeopardies, accidents, all of the things that may uh, affect Street of Santos integrity policy matters. And uh, as the meaning of the word, etymologically speaking, it is linked to integrality. When we create a public policy, this policy has to dialogue with the several uh, aspects and problems and challenges of society. We are uh, a result of the 20th century uh, way of learning and teaching. And when you were a specialist in one subject, it creates like something like as if you were doomed. And when academically speaking, we sometimes are fixed to one problem and we think that the solution is right there. Professor Shalita and Ana Claudia have mentioned the pandemic, for example. Some infectologists, some specialists, they deal the pandemic as the only reality in the universe. They say they, we need five, two year lockdown. Of course, in two years, everyone's going to die and no longer we are going to have the pandemics. So the idea is when we start centralizing uh, solutions with specialists, but working integrally and globally, the economists, for example, giving solutions to severe uh, legal problems, for example. So this is, a, this is the integrality I am talking about. It surpasses the essential idea of university, which is the open to the whole of the reality. We need to see things through different perspectives, social, economical, pedagogical, several different structures that, in, that are encompassed in the problem to find an integral solution. The integrity policy is so much linked to ethics and morality of society to find uh, an anti-corruption or waste or error solutions and how to minimize these uh, things in people's lives individually or as a society. And also it, also it is presented as an integrated solution because for each problem that is posed, we can analyze all the very different perspectives to it. And this, uh, a university is the best place for this sort of debate because we can deal with uh, law, health, peda uh, pedagogy, psychology, all of the aspects and all the many things that affect the, the society. So the objective of CEMAPI was to promote studies, projects, international and national events, exchanges, 
with universities, with multilateral organizations such as the United Nations, United Nations, OODC. And Mackenzie would add value to all of the debates within different scopes and academy, along with activities with the public and private sectors, companies, um, NGOs, all of them towards say, solving a compl the complex problems that we are facing from in modern reality. Another different uh, approach is that all of the studies are multidisciplinary. This is why uh, CEMAPI is a multidisciplinary center for advanced studies and is linked to APE, which maintains the universities, such as, for example, the law school in Brasilia, the, the medical school that has been recently incorporated to Mackenzie, Mackenzie uh, High School College, uh, elementary school, high school, how we can debate globally in collaboration with all of the many initiatives from Mackenzie. And as Ana Claudia said, Mackenzie is part of our life once we are, when we step inside Mackenzie, Mackenzie is never going to leave our heart. Of course, I entered Mackenzie, I studied law, and my wife also was a Mackenzie student, and then we had kids. All of our kids are former Mackenzie students. Two of them started in kindergarten and went all the way to the end of the university, and then they went overseas to study. But this is how our life is linked to Mackenzie, the, the feeling of being Mackenzie. So this is how we do it. Uh, we promote the center as part of an important life. Uh, it's, it's, it's there to foster innovation and foster other initiatives. Uh, in a very cross session and integrated manner. The things we want to debate are is, in, is all related to innovation. It about the use of technologies. We know that uh, in the development of uh, the computer, we are part of the first generation calculation, then the second generation with social media and the use of computer for social media. And then the third, which is related to virtual reality and immersive computing, augmented reality and artificial intelligence and how everything uh, merges into creating and supporting this new world, we still don't know how it is. There's a very large uh, program in uh, England called the Future of the Cities, where they analyze what would be the 50 next years of uh, British cities. So they started this project and what happened? Today, we are uh, analyzing uh, driverless cars. Cars won't will be only a service. When you use immersive computing, a TV that is a hardware will become a software, will become a service. How will all this affect our reality, our life, uh, the virtual reality we are experiencing? We are virtually so close now, but physically, uh, so far away. In Dubai, we have uh, the Expo 2020 that will be ha uh, held now in 2021. It's a huge fair and they want to turn that into a huge, in the greatest technology event of the century with the participation of 190 countries. We are scheduled to be there in the first week of December. It should be uh, in September, but Israel closed the frontiers because of the Delta strain. So we are uh, having all these international debates, and this is what we want to bring uh, to debate in Brazil, uh, to Mackenzie, debating also with the public sector and the private sector, thinking of a positive agenda for growth. As Ana Claudia mentioned, we have the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals for 2030. It has to do with our topic. 
Financial Times from 2019-2020 uh, launched this great theme. How are you going to review uh, the proposals of uh, capitalism? Since uh, the Berlin Wall came down, when uh, we had uh, communism and uh, in excess, a doctrine that didn't work, then we have capitalism that grew, had uh, enrichment and social benefits, but that left a huge gap between the rich and the poor. So how should we review this uh, way of thinking of capitalism and how would this shape the closing of this gap? And now we have this new global agenda called ESG, the Environment, Social and Governance Issues. How are we co going to compose all these values that greatly interest society when we are kind of rethinking capitalism within this perspective with including environment social issues in it reducing the distance between poor and rich people reducing extreme poverty for example in uh, the uh, global uh, the sustainable goals and uh, fighting against waste accidents and all that and just not forgetting when you think about abuse issues we also have uh, gender issues how can we prevent harassment and abuse against women and girls how can we promote equality between races how can we promote the city as a meeting place and not a place of so much uh, fear and disconnection. As I said, this center in uh, Colombia has this event called Global Cities. It's a yearly event. It's the fifth or sixth uh, edition. And that is why, uh, Professor Carlos, I consider your initiative very important because I think this uh, we have to think these issues always connected to global policies concerning the future of the cities. And then we have these themes that are really uh, take our center closer to this initiative of the architecture and urbanism school and other schools of our uh, university. The theme of education and digital development. This is something we want to bring uh, to debate in with local governments concerning uh, elementary uh, school and high school, looking at a way of looking at classrooms, especially in public uh, schools, where we have a system uh, just like the one in the 19th century, where you had professors lecturing, professors that either were formed in the uh, 20th century or that were educated by professors from the 20th century. So we have classrooms from the 19th century. We have uh, teachers that are half analogical, half digital, uh, kind of 20th century kind teachers. And then you have students from the 21st century. As Ana Claudia was saying in the slums, and I uh, the first picture she mentioned called my attention with a slums with uh, a, a, a line with lots of clothes hanging in. And in the back, you have an HD antenna. So access to technology today is an issue. And it's part of this minimum uh, social growth. We have gone no, uh, beyond uh, food needs. Uh, and incorporated technology uh, needs and for these kids who are being educated in the 21st century. So how can we bridge all these gaps between the, the structure of the classroom, the, the uh, uh, formation of the teachers and the structure of the kids? We have some experiences uh, throughout Brazil, like in the Amazon with the digital transformation for uh, teachers transforming uh, digital education. These are things that are being worked on. 
they are being taken to the Ministry of Education and the government. Then we have other uh, tax reform issues that really affect the citizens. And this is an issue that will bring all these multiple aspects because it involves law, economy, uh, public management, and uh, fiscal justice. How, who are you going to tax? Who, when, and how? If I tax services more, I greatly affect the development of the society. If I tax uh, commerce and industry, uh, I affect the society in another way. So uh, public power are, is always eager for revenues and the private sector is trying to uh, protect and uh, reduce the tax uh, burden. So these are issues that are very complex when you're trying to find uh, opportunities in, uh, in these areas. We have several issues that are common in our areas like corruption, protection against fraud, against waste, protection of vulnerable population. And in the realm of urban uh, planning, we have the matter of um, urban development. How are we going to plan land use? Uh, and it's important, it's interesting that when you're talking about infrastructure and environment, and going back to this study uh, developed in London that is uh, trying to foresee the next 50 years, if vehicles change and are self automatically driven, they will stop being an asset and will become a service. People will start working remotely because of the possibilities offered by technology because this was uh, something that started uh, appearing before the pandemics, but the pandemics made all this study advance, uh, bringing the need for remote uh, work. So what we see is the empty scene of the downtown uh, areas of the city. So urban centers that have huge parking areas with several levels and huge buildings, and downtown, what's going to happen to them? Will they be empty? Will be the, uh, will they be reduced? I remember when I worked in uh, New York, um, they moved to a building in New York, and it was curious that many partners uh, were already working remotely, but they needed a room. They uh, made a point of having a room, and they had to rent a room, so they had a, a floor to have this room. So uh, now from we are going to reduce from 20 to five or eight uh, floors for an office. So what will be the impact of that on our cities? So for example, in uh, architecture in urban planning school uh, college, we need your participation, Professor Leite, to debate these issues. What is the future of the cities going to be like with all these changes brought uh, by technology and how, on how people relate to each other of, of the future of our studies? So it's a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to participate in this event with all of you other speakers. And I'm eager for to participate in the debate and I'll be available for any future events you have. Great Professor Antonio Carlos Amaral. I think uh, through the presentation of your center, you brought several different agendas uh, to light. Uh, for us who are debating the cities, uh, the, the sustainable cities in all everything, cities that are based on the sustainable development goals. I think CEMAP is going to be another important ally for us here, especially with the launching of the next book. Professor Tadeusz Falavisk from uh, Columbia University uh, in New York. Welcome. You have been uh, with us since the morning session. You have the floor for 20 minutes of presentation, and then we are going to move on to some uh, questions and answers and a debate with 
uh, questions from the public. You have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yep. Great. Um, I, I will share my screen. I, I was just reflecting on uh, when I had the opportunity to visit Mackenzie. Uh, I think it was almost exactly 10 years ago, and I was in Sao Paulo for a conference on technology and the future of the city, uh, an Arc Futuro conference. And I was thinking just now about how much my feelings about that phrase, the future of cities, has changed in 10 years. As an architect and urban planner, um, the idea of the future of cities used to be very exciting for me in a way very inspiring. And now to be perfectly honest, when I hear that phrase, I think about it um, with a mix of dread and, um, and, and a lot of caution, you know? And I, I think um, for those of us who spend a lot of time thinking about the future of cities and cities in general, um, it, I think we, a lot of us have come to realize that we can't really be good custodians of the future of the city unless we really begin to reckon with our past in a better way. And um, so I'll, I'll be talking more about the past than the future today. Also, I, another way that my feelings about that phrase have changed is uh, I think our definition of city it really needs to be challenged and, and for us to think more expansively about how we better manage and understand patterns of human settlement. Uh, so with that, I'm going to talk a little bit today about a few places that are um, very, very much a part of uh, my life and, and my work and, and talk to you a little bit about the work that we have been doing at the uh, Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes at Columbia University, where an applied research center, and we sit within the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. Uh, and we are focused on trying to use the tools that are available to us in the power and the platform at Columbia University to empower communities that are on the front lines, most, most particularly of the climate crisis. And of course, this has been um, a terrible last few days for our uh, friends and colleagues in Southern Louisiana. And we really don't know how things will turn out with Hurricane Ida. New Orleans, I believe, still doesn't have power, but we are seeing more and more of these devastating climate events uh, on, on a very frequent basis. Um, and so uh, this is a map that was in the New York Times last week, talking about this, this story, one of the impacts of climate change and it's already apparent, this is, not a, this is not a forward projecting map. This is the last 30 years on average, half of the country, uh, the Eastern half, has become a lot wetter, a lot more rain and a lot more flood events like we just saw in Tennessee or what we're seeing now in Louisiana. And then the Western half of the country, California, it's getting a lot drier, uh, water shortages, and of course, devastating forest fires. So this is our reality. Um, and it, it is accelerating uh, these trends. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, my hometown for, for a few minutes, which is in uh, Western Pennsylvania. And I'll talk a little bit about the region that it's in. So like a lot of you, I, I believe that we need to make a just transition to a post-fossil fuel future. Um, the policy vehicle for that in the United States for the last 10 years has been call it at different times, the Green New Deal or Marshall Plan, or there are different ways to call it, but the Green New Deal is something that um, ha had, was introduced as legislation, um, a resolution last year, and, uh, and has some real life uh, now with President Biden and the infrastructure package and the subsequent uh, rebudgeting for the US federal government. Um, and we want to know what the Green New Deal would look like in different places around America. So this is um, the Ohio River Basin. And that star on the upper right-hand corner is my hometown. It's called Johnstown, Pennsylvania. It's part of this, this region. This is a region where most people do not live in large cities. Most people live in small communities. Many of those communities used to be much larger. This is a place that is rapidly losing population and has been for about the last 60 years. Um, it is a place where poverty is endemic, uh, where there is an opioid crisis. A lot of people without jobs are turning to addiction. 
And um, it's a place, it is America's first extraction landscape. This is where the coal uh, and the oil that powered the industrial expansion of America in the late 19th and early 20th century came from. And where today there is still gas deep underground that is being hydraulically fractured and turned um, into both power, but also into, um, into um, plastic, as if we need more plastic in the world. But, um, and this is a place of course, where, where Donald Trump is, uh, his, his banner is affixed to every bar and every auto shop, every, every billboard, and even after the election. So um, it's a place of extreme partisan conflict in some ways. And so we um, somewhat recklessly came there um, to have a workshop about what the Green New Deal could, could look like on the ground. And this is what it looks like there. This is a wild landscape. And I'm just going to talk briefly about the history that you know, the Appalachian Mountains um, pose sort of the first barrier to westward expansion of the British and then later American colonial footprint. And so there were canals cut through these mountains to uh, allow for this westward expansion. And these canals, in a, in a, and this is a tale about the failure of infrastructure, but to supply these canals, there were uh, reservoirs built in the mountains. And, um, and that allowed for this industrial expansion, the extraction of coal. It made vast fortunes for people like Andrew Carnegie and Henry Clay Frick. Uh, and they built um, summer homes in, along some of these reservoirs, which were later abandoned. And then in my hometown, one of these reservoirs above, above my hometown collapsed in 1889 and sent this massive wall of water uh, that completely destroyed the city. And there's a great book about it. Um, about 4,000 people lost their lives. But the city, I mean, as you see here, which was about uh, 30,000 people at the time, uh, rapidly grew to a city of about 90,000 people in the early 1920s. And they encroached again upon the river. And it was a booming time, but not for everyone. In fact, as uh, industry expanded, a lot of, of Children of former slaves or even former slaves themselves from the South, from the cotton economy, came North to work in steel and, um, and, and soon found themselves in conflict with people like my grandparents who came there from Europe to, to work in the mills and mines. And this, this legacy of uh, racism, one the mayor of um, the town of Johnstown told all the black population to leave. Um, in 1923. And so this, this, this legacy of racism continues to scar the landscape today. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan helped the mayor chase the black population out of town. A few years later, it flooded again. And this time the federal government came in and built a massive infrastructure project a levee or, well, these are actually river walls, but this is what the Army Corps of Engineers or what civil engineers do everywhere. They try to put the water in a box. This was 1936, but this is going on today. This is exactly the same construction system that's used on, on the lower Mississippi Valley or anywhere else where the Army Corps of Engineers or civil engineers want to control water. But this time the city's economic expansion began to rapidly decline. The, per the reasons for this, globalization, moving jobs to cheaper labor markets, and um, the city didn't necessarily lose wealth. A lot of what happened was the abandon abandonment of downtowns. Sarah was talking about this earlier. And uh, as the downtown was abandoned, there was another flood um, in the year I was born, 1977. Um, but uh, when this flood struck, people rebuilt a lot less because, as we know, disasters sort of accelerate ongoing trends. So if a city's growing and then experiences a disaster, you can experience uh, a rapid uh, increase in economic activity as they rebuild. But if a city is declining, it uh, goes into a more rapid decline. This is what the city has looked like um, while I was growing up. And here it is today. So we came there as these river walls are beginning to crumble 
and the Army Corps of Engineers is asking, what could we, what kind of infrastructure uh, should we rebuild? And of course, they want to rebuild the river walls as they were, maybe a little bit higher. And we had a workshop with the community there to talk about what other things could be built there. Like, how would we use the river walls or rethinking the relationship between the community and the rivers and, and the lands around the rivers to really rethink about uh, the social and economic life of the city. And so we had uh, an intense conversation and, and it turned out that a lot of what we talked about didn't, didn't fall upon those, um, that, that uh, political fracturing between um, those who believe that uh, the, the future should be um, led by the capitalists, led by technologies, led by Donald Trump, and those who believe in a government uh, intervention or those who believe in a just transition to a Green New Deal, we realized that actually everybody wanted the same things. Um, they wanted to see uh, more and more um, public schools being funded. They wanted to see uh, new industries being built, new in new technologies, renewable energy. They wanted to see if, if abandoned buildings and abandoned houses could be rebuilt to strengthen the community. Um, and, and they wanted to see if, if the rivers could be rethought of, not as something to be feared, but as a real asset. So in the background, I was learning that even though this area has experienced a lot more rain over the last 30 years, and will experience it, uh, experience a lot more rain in the next 30 years, 50% more according to the climate projections. Uh, it doesn't flood anymore. And so here's an aerial image uh, from 1940 of this town. Um, and you can see that a lot of the hillsides were completely, um, uh, uh, the trees were removed and they were deforested to make way for industry, for coal mining. Um, and today, um, the forests have grown back. And I don't think it's the river walls that are preventing the flooding. I think it's the forests. And this may be a convincing argument for degrowth um, or rethinking our patterns of settlement in places like this that are experiencing rapid climate change. Uh, but also, it's, I think it's an argument for really centering nature uh, in the way that we think about our human settlements. So now I'll talk about in the next half, I think I have maybe 10 more minutes, I'll talk about uh, a New York City, um, my adopted home. Uh, this is Red Hook, Brooklyn during Hurricane Sandy almost 10 years ago um, in 2012. Uh, this is an industrial neighborhood in the center of New York Harbor. Um, this is it in the golden age of the shipping. Um, but of course, uh, shipping declines and a lot of these waterfront parcels have been long abandoned. And there's a long conversation going on in waterfront neighborhoods in New York City uh, about what this land becomes. And in many cases, industrial land on the waterfront has become high rise housing, has become uh, a refuge for global capital, uh, a place to store money for, for, for vast fortunes that have been made um, in the last um, 40 years of uninhibited capitalism. Um, and, but in this place, uh, they haven't uh, gentrified so rapidly. And it's in part because this area floods, not just in Sandy, but constantly. It's also isolated in many ways uh, because of uh, it's cut off by uh, uh, Robert Moses era highway, um, and also because there has been substantial community opposition to um, developing in that pattern. Um, so we did some scenario planning to talk about what this place could become. Would it become like what some people refer to as the Gold Coast, um, other places in New York City where um, real estate developers have had their way, uh, or would it become uh, something else entirely. And um, I'll talk a little bit. Uh, we were in the middle of this conversation when the COVID pandemic hit. Um, and this is a little timeline of the early, the first wave of cases in New York City. And um, as we know from, as, as every current event tells us or reinforces, disasters come um, in battalions, you know, they, 
they there are cascading events. Um, and so at the beginning of the COVID pandemic in New York City, um, there was there was a series of, uh, as I think you all know, police killings of unarmed uh, black people all over the United States, um, starting with Breonna Taylor in, um, uh, in, in Louisville, Kentucky, and then George Floyd in Minneapolis. And this led to um, a, a, an enormous amount of uh, civil unrest or, and also reckoning on, at all sectors of society with uh, long ignored um, systemic ra racism, not ignored by everyone, but certainly ignored by institutions such as my own at Columbia University and, and many others. And so reckoning with this um, long festering racial injustices and police violence, but also we were very concerned about heat waves because the year before was the highest recorded uh, temperatures um, and we had seen deadly uh, heat waves in Northern Europe and we were expecting a very hot summer in New York City. And so we as urban designers tried to be tactical and started to put together a plan um, for using public streets to create cooling corridors ways to cool down this neighborhood that gets disproportionately hot because of in its legacy of industrialization um, and its legacy of, uh, of disinvestment, uh, uh, not a lot of trees, not a lot of parks. And so it gets disproportionately hotter in the summer. So we wanted to make this neighborhood cooler by using public space. Um, and we launched this Cool Streets program and had some designers come up with ideas like tactical ideas for how to cool down this, the streets. And it was fun. Um, and it was in some ways um, a, a good thing to do, but actually um, uh, it was a failure in many respects because it, we can't put a Band-Aid on the festering problems in our cities through just trying to make incremental improvements. The problems in Red Hook have more to do with systemic racism and with uh, the racial wealth divide in our community. So here's, Red Hook is a community that similar in size to my hometown. There's about 20,000 people who live there. Um, 75% uh, of them live in public housing, meaning they have 0% home ownership. And then the other half of, or the other um, quarter of the population is largely white, largely homeowners, um, uh, extremely like 10 times as much wealth. Um, and these patterns reflect uh, historic divisions that can be expressed by um, patterns of spatial segregation that go, go back uh, nearly a century. Um, and this underlies all of our planning and urban design work in this community. So after Sandy, there was a community conversation about how does this neighborhood recover from Hurricane Sandy? And, and there was a decision to prioritize public housing, which makes a lot of sense, and also to put incremental barriers to help um, the rest of the neighborhood. So in prioritizing public housing, there are dozens, maybe maybe even close to a hundred public meetings where well-meaning architects and urban planners like me went out to public housing and talked about uh, all these improvements that would be made. And, but yet when the construction came during the pandemic summer last year, um, the first thing that happened was tearing down all the trees and uh, basically leaving these poorly insulated um, buildings uh, where 12, for where a majority of the population lived close to the poverty level um, that suffer uh, disproportionately high rates of childhood asthma um, that have are particularly vulnerable to respiratory disease. In fact, I believe uh, one survey showed that half the population uh, in the houses experiences some sort of um, respiratory disease. And that's even before the COVID pandemic. So disproportionately exposed um, to the COVID pandemic, they suddenly uh, lose all of their trees and therefore the buildings are heating up. And um, so how do we make sure that this doesn't happen again? How do we like learn from this so that our 
even when we come out to a place with the best of intentions to say, uh, be allies and work on behalf of communities, we aren't just making our plans and then cutting down all the trees and moving on as if we've made a victory. And the other thing that's happening in Red Hook, by the way, and this relates also that I feel like Sarah, like earlier today said all the things I wanted to say about the future of the cities in general, which is that e-commerce is changing our cities in a really big way that we have not reckoned with at all. Um, in some ways, you know, Sarah talked about the competition for curb space, and I love this idea of zoning our curbs, zoning our sidewalks so that we can more justly apportion how much space we're giving to Amazon and UPS and all the other uh, um, um, uh, people who uh, bring us e-commerce. Um, but the other part of e-commerce is these massive last mile warehouse facilities, notoriously hostile to labor. Um, in fact, many of these are uh, planned to be completely robotic, but basically Red Hook is becoming New York City's loading dock. There are six of these last mile warehouses being built on all of this waterfront land I talked about before. And so this area, which has, um, has a lot of children, a lot of children disproportionately exposed to respiratory disease, is going to see a lot more trucks moving through the streets every day. And then those trucks are going out to every neighborhood in the city and, and crowding curbs and, 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 um, and making the traffic situation untenable. Locking in uh, dependence on fossil fuel uh, infrastructure uh, and so we really need to examine um, what e-commerce is doing to our communities here. So UPS presenting their, um, and here is just the anger of the community um, the, to uh, responding to this, this sort of cataclysmic change in this, the character of this neighborhood without any public uh, process and protests. Um, so here's a graphic summary. These, these last mile warehouses are strangling our cities, are strangling this neighborhood. E-commerce is in many ways strangling small businesses in our communities, um, but there are things that could be done. Um, so now I'm just gonna end by uh, talking about um, what another way that we learned uh, lessons from that experience in Red Hook was to think about who is responsible for changing our streets. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm echoing Sarah from this morning. How do we, who, who is it that should really be um, deciding who owns the street? Who, who can benefit from these outdoor restaurants or from uh, the pedestrianization of streets or from the way that we rethink highways in all of our public space um, in, in the city? And um, so there was a suggestion made to us that we should go work with some high school students near Columbia University because they had a plan to take the street in front of their school um, and turn it into a park for what they called a clean air green corridor. And so this is 182nd Street in Upper Manhattan. And there's about five public high schools along the street. Um, this is, again, I think with all of our projects, we try to look, take a deep look at history in order to understand the future. So here's Washington Heights, hardwood forests in 1609. But then um, in the, uh, as the city expanded during the late 19th and 20th centuries, more and more, first of all, rich mansions of wealthy merchants being built here and industrialists, um, and then later uh, more and more dense housing. And then the Wa George Washington Bridge was built um, in the 1950s, and a lot of um, uh, tenements have been built at this at this time to house a growing immigrant population, um, more and more people from Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, and uh, the Cross Bronx Expressway was built and connected to Upper Manhattan. So an enormous volume of trucks and cars moves through this very narrow uh, piece of land that is very densely populated every day. And so we installed air monitors to begin to look at how the outdoor and indoor air quality of these schools was being impacted 
um, by the trucks that move past every day. And the students have, have engaged, you can check out their Instagram feed. They, they're constantly doing their own science, learning about environmental injustice in their own backyard. And we took them out with thermal cameras to map the urban heat island effect and try to understand why their neighborhood is disproportionately hotter than the richer, whiter, uh, more heavily invested in neighborhood um, just up the road. And we've begun to map that with them. And then also um, talking with them about what the future could be, what could, how do we understand the city as it is today and um, make plans for how to design this corridor in the future. And they're also leading the way in conversations with the city about how to think about streets no longer just as places for the smaller and smaller population that owns private cars, but how do we use them to connect school children to parks? Um, and so uh, finally, we're working with the mayor's office of uh, climate resiliency in New York City right now on this climate adaptation roadmap, um, because we really need to understand how climate change is affecting our different neighborhoods differently um, based on our history and um, think about what, what, what are the things that we need to do very comprehensively to address the climate crisis, not just adaptation and mitigation, but really looking at how we got where we are, what are the forces that have shaped the city over time and how those created the climate consequences that we feel today. And then what are the other things that we've learned over time um, the social movements, uh, the, the values that we have inherited from a long struggle for justice, environmental justice, economic justice, and racial justice that can inform uh, how we begin to move forward in the uh, climate crisis. So that's about, uh, I think maybe I went a little bit over time, sorry, but thank you for listening to me today and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much to Deus. Muito bom. É, acho que começamos aqui com algumas belíssimas lindas. É, I pro... think we have started with uh, several very interesting um, provocations from philosophers and people who thought beyond our times, starting with uh, Gabriel Chalita and uh, completing uh, with dimensions of uh, climate change made by Tadeus in uh, how they are changing the lives in the cities and demanding a change of paradigm. No doubt the crisis we have been observing since before uh, the pandemics, cities have always experienced transformation, sometimes for the better, based, based uh, in the study of the crisis. And in the pandemics, uh, we have the obligation of looking with greater attention at that. Here at uh, the university, we tr what we need to do is think of the future, try to mitigate in the fate, thinking of more uh, balanced and equitable uh, and sustainable cities. I'm going to share my screen we have some more minutes for our debate and i want to bring some questions to start this uh debate i'm sharing my screen okay i mentioned a few issues uh over which i have been about which i have been thinking thinking about an urban agenda from now on for the future, challenges and possibilities. I think all through the morning and afternoon, we are, we've mentioned about empowering local governments, especially with a little last speech by Tadeus, uh, thinking about the cities we live in, uh, how much more we can do to face social division, climate change, new forms of urban governance. Uh, Gabriel Chalita mentioned that uh, in a more poetic manner. Ana Claudia mentioned that in a more strong way, thinking about pol public policies. 
and uh, linking with the speech by Antonio Carlos, how can we uh, quickly and urgently create public policies for our cities based on more detailed data at city level that integrate and territorialize public policies and action plans. Always starting now on the left here, based on strengthening local communities, uh, regulatory milestones and things like that, with uh, an evolution of the societies in small communities, as Tadeus mentions, uh, the evolution of the society towards smaller communities characterized by strong relationships of uh, mutual support systems uh, with individuals. We also mentioned the 15-minute city defended by uh, the mayor of uh, Paris. And how can we bring that to the different diverse realities we have in our peripheries in the cities in the global south that lack even uh, basic sanitation. As Charlita said, uh, millions and millions of people that don't have the basic, don't have water or sanitation. How can we transform uh, the 15 minute city of uh, Paris, Barcelona and in uh, the s s peripheries of the global uh, south? We need uh, dignified housing, social equip equipment, public services, public spaces, green areas, strengthening and incentives for local commerce so people have to move uh, less. And we always have a great difficulty to mention another uh, urban economics what the city offers of more that is more robust both that is opportunities how can we bring these opportunities to our peripheral areas we no doubt least need a changing paradigm we need to adopt uh, public uh, policies climate change, uh, focus on climate changes. We need to anticipate um, sanitation changes, public policies based on evidences, local action plans, and to mention a philosopher, a sociologist, Richard Sennett from the London School of Economics. How can we transform uh, technologies and smart cities in more humane cities? And the challenge for all of us in the southern hemisphere of bringing more sensibility. And we've uh, we are facing immense challenges in Brazil of children and teenagers who are not having any access to knowledge due to lack of internet coverage or devices. Another uh, thinker and philosopher, Carlo Ratti, he optimistically mentions uh, that uh, in the near future, we are going to have a flexibility of routine brought by the pandemics as we've seen. All uh, shifts uh, and times that are uh, encompassed by the city are going to be different. We're not gonna have the rush time anymore People used to work uh, at very fixed uh, at times. Now everything is flexible. Everything is going to be rethought and the flow in the city is going to change. And of course, optimistically, this may be interesting in the future. And considering what happens in Sao Paulo, if you consider greater Sao Paulo, 20 million people, we have people who leave the peripheral areas of the of the great Sao Paulo coming into the main uh, city and just waste four hours of their lives every day with, because uh, transportation is not efficient. So commuting is about to die. And on the other side, 
of course, we have to remember that this radical change that is uh, happening already is going to happen to us, to the middle class mostly, those who have the possibility to work remotely. And uh, whereas the rest of the city is going to linger on demanding physical workers to commute, how can we qualify and resignify the city for the whole population. And I'm going to close by mentioning uh, research that we are uh, carrying out uh, here at Mackenzie with uh, Paulo Saldiva, professor at uh, the University of Sao Paulo. He says the postcode is the greatest predictor of the health of an individual uh, in a city of Brazil. Tell me where you live, tell me your postcode, and I'll tell you how your health is going. It is very bad. In very noble neighborhoods, the, uh, the life expectancy is similar to a, a first world country, whereas if you were born in the outer, outer suburbs, you are going to have about 20 years less in expectance. And just to close, mentioning Claudia Fosbar, citing her, uh, pre creating precarious neighborhoods is key, if not the key, for post-pandemic recovery. Well, I am about to close and leave you with these thoughts so that we can uh, move forward to final considerations and a Claudia. Sara, thank you for coming back for this afternoon session. Tadeus, Gabriela, Jörg, welcome back, Jörg. And those who would like to make any comments, please feel free. You have the floor and you have the mic. Ana Claudia Rospa. I was about to answer through the chat, but I'm going to reply, João Teixeira, how to foment public spaces of discuss local discussions. It was never in, as important as now. After 20 years of smart cities research, the democratic spaces have been open. It's important that the citizens know of this space and of these channels when they are open so that the democracy can be ensured. And on the other side, we have never been as much activism as now. Uh, for the next uh, debate, I think we should bring more youngsters to debate with us and include them in this debate. I think it's important. Uh, we have this marginalized uh, population who cannot watch lives or take part in webinars. It's of utmost importance uh, to see and give proper value to social gatherings and uh, to address problems such as of home violence and other concerns. Let's use these available spaces. And uh, this is what I wanted to say. Thank you. Gabriel Chalita, I'd like to greet every one of you. Everything you said was uh, very significant and they uh, come to a common uh, idea, the explanations and all of the El, uh, technological elements mentioned, these great storage areas and the movements. The technology brings this fascinating possibility of communication from different places. Technology helps with transportation, with medicine, with everything, and it helps with city planning. But on the other side, there is one concern that we need to work with is the dimension of city consciousness. I see a lot of professors who go to physical uh, bookstores so that these bookstores don't die because these are gathering points. These are meeting points in the city. We need to look at corners and, and we have to see the pleasure that these corners can promote in the city. Another thing is the lack of paying attention to people. Sometimes I'm perplexed with discourses. People say uh, people in the situation of streets, they live on the streets. Uh, people say 
that the city should be cleaned as if these people could not or represent something dirty. It's something beautiful that Ana Claudia said is let's worship and give value to collective uh, gatherings, people who are worried and address problems uh, of the social gathering and communities. I think it's difficult that through uh, politics, because we need uh, uh, to solve problems very fast, sometimes we don't get deep into problems. Sometimes we think that the problem is local and we have a local discussion because we need an immediate response. But the solution is much more complex than that. I have a precarious view and I end up having to convince these people of the simplicity of these solutions. Of course, these are very uh, uh, important speeches you've given. And Antonio, Carlo, Antonio Carlos talking about non-sharing of problems. Well, this is just so essential. This is uh, coming back to Parmenides' idea that the he was still a doxa then with excessive opinion giving. We need to look for aletheia, uncurtained prejudice. Let's put our doubts on the table. We now have too many certainties for so many doubts. It's a pleasure uh, having this opportunity to be here today. So before I give the floor to Professor Antonio Carlos, I'm going to bring you a provocation, Antonio Carlos. Please uh, address this if you can. I was in a very long debate with ECLE's directors, an international organization that acts uh, very strongly with uh, climate change in Latin America. And he was reminding us of the, of the question of having at this moment, an urgent need for reorganization involving pol uh, policies and structures to uh, help cities instead of nations, because we, there are many problems. One of them is climate change, but not only this. I'd like to listen to what you have to say in this regard. Do you think we have the possibility, for example, or uh, up, is of considering how to how the United Nations uh, thinks putting uh, giving power to local management and mayors, for example. Thank you, Carlos. Eh, it's just so curious that I had written something down in this regard. I had written us just a very short analysis of mun uh, in regard to municipalities, uh, empowering cities. And why is that? If you come to think the, the state, the subnational uh, scope does not have a territory, cities do. The physical space where citizens live for our existence, like everyone, like Shalit and Claudia have mentioned all that most of the time. The state is uh, the addition of so many cities and all of that uh, encompassed into a country for international rights. How can we put our city in this big projection as a protagonist of public policies? Just to answer one of the questions that was posed in the chat by Ricardo Constantino, how can we bring bring from the periphery, from the outskirts, to occupy spaces that are not being used downtown anymore. I think it's a very important po uh, uh, point of view. It is part of, uh, I, I did my master's on lobby and advocacy, but how can we bring the several different social groups, groups of interest into the, creation and formation of public policies. How can we turn the advocacy, as far as defense is, con is concerned, into something that is part of a defense and idea promoter for, gov uh, for the government? And just to close my speech, it was a pleasure to take part. Uh, Rockefeller Center in the United States, um, the, the, he, the office is part of the Harvard University. He was the founder and the first president of the university, the Rockefellers. We've generated several scholarships on, on public health and urban planning. 
What I mean by that is, Carlos, I think that we should bring something to this debate. We bring, we need to bring the, the public organizations into this debate. The United Nations, as far as I know, they have a, a, a point of view on this. Uh, but of course, for 2030, we are going to see a proximity of the goals with uh, the need of city empowerment. It was an honor to be part of this event, and I am available for further activities. Just to finish what Carlos Leite, Professor Carlos Leite said, he said he was waiting for the book. Yes, we are organizing a book on uh, economic developments. There is a uh, um, um, we are mentioning a professor that was uh, that uh, that passed away just recently. He's is receiving uh, kudos in this book. So I'm counting on Professor Leite when I launch the book. So thank you. Sorry. Mm, okay, that's great. Tadeus, Jörg, Sarah, would you like to send a final message? Thank you for having us. It is so interesting to hear from all of you. And I, I, I appreciate these debates. Um, I'd like to um, come back sometime and thank you. Yes, it's time after 10 years, it's time for you to, to, to come back to Brazil and to Sao Paulo. Huh? <laughs> it will be a pleasure to receive you again here. Muito bom. Uh, eu gostaria... Well, very good. I now would like to thank everyone for being here. Thank you for attending during our morning and our afternoon session. And I would like to inform that our event has been recorded, both the sessions. They are going to be edited and then we are going to upload it in our YouTube channel, uh, Mackenzie's channel on YouTube. And it's going to be available probably next week. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Bye, Carlos and everyone. It was great. Thank you. All the best. Bye bye. Thank you. Very good. See you soon. See you soon. Thank you very much. Muito obrigado, Claudia, Jéssica, o apoio técnico aí. Muito bom, viu? Deu tudo certo. Obrigada a você, professor. Obrigada, professor. Uh, só um minutinho, nós já desativamos a interpretação. Aí eu vou pedir a Jéssica para desativar, para a gente poder falar umas uh, pala de palavrinhas e agradecer. Olá, professor Leite, aqui é a Mônica, outra intérprete que estava na sessão. Muito obrigada mais uma vez pela confiança no nosso trabalho. Foi muito bom mesmo. Eu estava quase querendo colocar uma pergunta aqui para vocês, é que não deu tempo de tão legal que estava. <risos> eu devia ter colocado, né? Eu devia ter colocado. Ai, não é, deu é... tempo, mas foi muito bom, assim, foi muito incrível. É, eu acho que foi bom. Eu sempre fico assim um pouco, um pouco desapontado com a quantidade de público. De manhã a gente teve uns 80, 87 no pico, à tarde foi bem menos, né? metade disso. Mas eu não sei se você... Eu participo de muitos pelo Mackenzie e também pelo INSPER, onde eu estou, e eu tenho lá no INSPER, inclusive, muito mais do que no Mackenzie, né? os webinars. E a gente tem visto assim, uma, uma caída realmente bem grande de público. Eu não sei, acho que as pessoas estão tá tendo uma overdose de eventos, não sei, né? É, esse aqui, olha, eu divulguei, divulguei, divulguei muito, viu? Faz um, três semanas. É, Professor, mas... eu vou só fechar aqui a gravação e a gente...